Okay, so the part of James chapter 3 I want to focus on in verses 1 through 6. So let's take a look at 1 through 6 again real quickly. It says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. That's a pretty powerful statement about the tongue and the power that it has over us and the way that it can affect other people. And what I want to preach about tonight is the role of social media in the life of a Christian and really the danger that it can pose to actual local New Testament churches. You have to understand, social media is really a tool. It's an avenue by which we can speak and it amplifies our voice. And so there's a lot of positive things that can come from that. You know, when I first got on Facebook, but the whole reason I got on there was Pastor Anderson was giving out some free CDs and I didn't want to miss out on it. So I got my account up and got all my free CDs and started realizing, oh, wow, there's, you know, this radio thing going on and this and that. And, and I got a lot of positive things out of it. But the flip side of that is if you go on to social media and use that as a microphone for your voice and you are speaking corrupt communications, you are speaking evil things or wicked things, you can do a ton of damage by that same token. And so what we really need to do is realize there's consequences for corrupt communication and we can have a bad effect on the local New Testament church based on what we do there. So by way of introduction, just a couple things to keep in mind. This is not an indictment against social media. Again, there's positive things that come of it. So we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but this is sort of a call to be deliberate in our thought process and how we're thinking about things. The other thing is this does need to be addressed because social media really is sort of this no man's land that really lacks accountability. Um, it's kind of the bathroom wall of society. Anybody can write anything they want and pretty much get away with it. And um, that's problematic because people are are watching what we post and the things that we say and we really need to examine the gap sometimes that is between what the Bible says we should say and how we ought to conduct ourselves and often the way we actually end up conducting ourselves in social media. Turn to Ephesians 5. Let's start with Ephesians 5. I'm going to read to you from Matthew 12, verses 36 and 37, while you turn there. Matthew 12, 36 and 37, it says, But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be justified condemned. And so our words have great importance. There's meaning to our words and our words affect people. It affects individual souls. God places a great emphasis on his word. Jesus is the word. By his word we get saved through the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation. So words are a big thing. Words are not a small thing. Words really do matter. So the title of my sermon tonight is called Facebook Baptist Church. And I call it Facebook Baptist Church because there's this entire subculture of independent fundamentalist Baptists where they have this sort of collective fellowship and there can be a lot of benefits to that. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes it takes on a life of its own. And again, the concern is that it starts actually affecting the local New Testament church. So you're at Ephesians 5 right now. Look at verse 15. Let's look at verses 15 and 16. It says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. So the first problem with Facebook Baptist Church is it does not redeem the time. Ephesians 5 
says that we're not to be fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So here's what you can infer from that. If you're wise, you're making good use of your time. If you're a fool, you're just sort of frittering it away. Let's look at examples of some fools in the Bible that are not redeeming the time. Turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts 17. While you turn there, I'm going to read to you from 1 Timothy chapter 5. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, it says, and this is speaking of widows, and withal they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. You know, when people have a lot of idle time and a lot of free time on their hands, guess what? They just talk to talk. And next thing you know, they're saying things that they shouldn't be saying. We tendeth towards tattling, towards busybodiness, towards gossip. This is not a good thing. You're in Acts 17. Look at verse 21. Acts 17, verse 21. It says, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. So the Athenians basically were this society that was getting to this point where all they wanted to do was know what was new and to hear something that tickled their ears. That really is America. Um, you know, this is the problem. Facebook Baptist Church does not redeem the time in so many ways because even people with good intentions, here's what Facebook turns into. It turns into this default activity. We're not going on there always because we have a purpose or a reason. It has almost turned into the modern come home and instead of plopping down on the couch and turning on the television, we get on social media just to see what other people are saying, right? It's just a way to kind of see what's going on. Now that in and of itself isn't always this horrible thing to do, but the the problem is, as it becomes this default activity, now we're not even keeping track of how are we actually spending our lives. You know, we have a finite amount of time in this world to get something done for the Lord. I had a friend who put an app on his phone because he was just curious how much time he spent on Facebook. And this was not a guy who did a lot of posting. I mean, he'd like stuff here and there and every once in a while you'd see something. But he said he was shocked because after the first day he already saw he spent close to two hours a day on Facebook. You know, it, it's five minutes here, it's 10 minutes there, it's 20 minutes there. There are a lot of people who probably think they spend next to no time on there and they're probably frittering away an hour, two hours every day just looking at stuff liking stuff it goes on and on so it does not redeem the time it just turns into this default activity so that's the first problem but here's the second thing what could you be doing if you weren't actually on facebook just checking things out could you imagine if you just frittered away two hours a day on social media, if you took just half of that and put an extra hour into Bible reading, or you put an extra hour into soul winning, or an extra hour into prayer, it would just, it would transform your life. Spiritually, there would be so much fruit from that. It would be so profitable. It's not just a matter of not wasting time. It's what could you have been doing had you not been doing that. And so there's so many other ways that we could be filling our time in. And again, this isn't about us examining other people. This is about looking at yourself and your own personal habits and honestly asking yourself, you know, how am I spending my time? Turn to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. <clears throat> Look at verse 8 and verse 9. Titus chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. This is what it says. This is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Contentions Strivings about the law, these things the Bible says are unprofitable and vain. And you know what? The New Testament local church, it, it strives towards being in one accord. The whole point of it is it tendeth itself towards everybody coming together and growing closer as they know the Lord and, and being in one accord in doctrine. But you know, Facebook Baptist Church tendeth itself really towards things that are unprofitable and vain, towards contentions, towards pride. And you see that 
all the time, if you're paying attention and just looking at some of the stuff that's going on there. But let's just say you don't believe that's the case. Let's say in your mind, you know, I go on Facebook, but I have godly conversations with godly people, and it's, it's all very edifying and encouraging, and that very well can be the case. Again, I'm not saying anything about anybody's personal Facebook usage or social media usage, but let's just go with that assumption that everything is profitable. Here's the thing you still have to understand. We have a finite amount of time on this earth. We only have so much time to reach a lost world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the problem with Facebook is, best case scenario, it's probably not the most efficient way to minister to people. I understand that people use it as a ministry tool in their personal lives, and you know what? Praise God for anybody you're able to affect positively for the gospel. But you know, I think of Facebook as like the vacation Bible school of ministry. And here's what I mean by that. Sean and I, we were going down Highway 69 the other day. And there's a sign up and it's got Yoda on it, right? And it says Spirit Wars. And it's for their vacation Bible school. And they're trying to combine... Star Wars with like getting saved and learning about the Lord, right? Now, I've participated in vacation Bible school programs. We would go and for a week, you know, everybody would knock themselves out putting on this big program for the kids and making it fun for them and sharing the gospel. And here's the thing. The great thing is kids would get saved. It's not that there wasn't anything good about it. There was great things about it. But here's the deal. You have dozens of people putting literally hundreds of man hours into putting on this one week event so that I'm, at least where I was at, you'd get half a dozen, a dozen kids saved and praise God for every one of them that was saved. But here's the thing, those same couple hundred of hours, if they would have put that into soul winning, they would have saved 10 times as many people. And it doesn't mean that they have to leave VBS, Vacation Bible School, behind, but the real tragedy is that would be their evangelical push for the year. I mean, a lot of independent fundamentalist Baptist churches around here, it's like Vacation Bible School, it's Bible Camp, and then see you next year. I mean, that's our evangelism. That's a problem. If they would have gone from Vacation Bible School back to soul winning, that would make more sense to me. But, but when that just becomes your evangelistic tool, you kind of have to ask yourself, we're putting hundreds of hours into this, and we could instead follow the Bible and preach the gospel publicly and house to house, teaching, baptizing, and preaching in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and we'd have way better results. Facebook is the same thing. I don't care how positive your intentions are and how great your ministry is. At the end of the day, you will never convince anybody who really pays attention to this book that 10 hours on Facebook is as efficient as 10 hours of soul winning. It's not going to happen. And here's your proof. Think about the churches we associate with. You know, just off the top of my head, I can think of easily a dozen great men of God that go to like Verity Baptist Church and Faithful Word Baptist Church. And you know what? The vast majority of them either don't even have a social media account or they spend very little time on there. I mean, I can think of guys that don't even have accounts and they're becoming missionaries. They're becoming pastors. You know why? Because when men work hard and they're on fire for the Lord, they usually don't have a ton of time left over to make a bunch of Kermit the Frog memes. It just doesn't work out that way. We got too much other stuff to do. And again, you can do whatever you want on social media. This isn't, you know, against any one person or what you're doing, but are you deliberately thinking about and considering, as a Christian, how are you using your time? It's important. Facebook Baptist Church does not redeem the time. The second problem is Facebook Baptist Church confuses influence with authority. It confuses influencing people with actually having authority over people. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 15. 2 Samuel 15. I want to look at verses 1 through 6. 2 Samuel 15, starting in verse 1. And it came to pass after this, 
that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Just by way of reminder, Absalom's David's son. And what he's doing is he's at the gates and he's basically promoting himself and politically gaining traction by essentially kissing up to all the people. He's there in the gates declaring his own goodness. And while he's doing that, keep in mind, he's basically underhandedly bad-mouthing his own father. And let, let's remember this. God gives three institutions. We have the family, we have the church, and we have human government. And there's Absalom undercutting his dad as his father, and then also undercutting him as the king. So this is actually a rebellious thing that Absalom is doing. And yet, he's gaining friends. He's gaining traction. Go to verse 10 and 13. 10 through 13. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as ye hear the sound of the trumpet, then ye shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And with Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called, pay attention to this, and they went in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. And Absalom sent for Ahithophel the Gilanite, David's counselor from his city, even from Gilo, while he offered sacrifices and and the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. And there came a messenger to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. This is classic, fake it till you make it. Basically, Absalom is just declaring, you know, that, that he has power, follow after me, and you know what? People fall for it. And this is influence instead of authority. He had no authority to do that, but he was influenced influencing the people. That is a perfect picture of what you see on Facebook today. You have people that go in there, declare themselves a pastor, declare themselves a teacher, declare themselves an instructor of God, and meanwhile they do not qualify according to biblical qualifications. Remember, this is our authority. Yes, this should influence us, but this is also our authority. But you have people on Facebook that go on there and basically just by declaring I am this person, there's always going to be a percentage of the population that's going to follow after that. It's a huge danger. And so Facebook Baptist Church does a really good job of confusing influence with authority. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 1. Just go a book over, 1 Kings chapter 1. We'll take a look at it again. Just a few verses here, just to sort of press this point home. <clears throat> Look at verse 5, 1 Kings 1. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and fifty men to run before him. And his father had not displeased him at any time, and saying, Why hast thou done so? And he also was a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. And he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and they, following Adonijah, helped him. And so what happens is these false teachers get there on Facebook. They declare themselves pastor, teacher, you name it. Fake it till you make it, and they drag people away with them. And listen, if you just look at the biblical account of this, all right, Joab did in Absalom. Remember, he kind of got caught in the tree, and Joab did him in. But when you look at Adonijah, he got executed. There was a guy named Shimei that kind of followed after Absalom, executed. Joab I ended up going after Adonijah, executed. So you see this pattern where these people that want to come in and override God's authority and declare, you know, this is who I am and I'm a man of God, 
it never ends well. And then the people that get carried off with them, it doesn't end well for them either. That's a big problem. And it's something that people aren't always aware of because there's many people that can go in and they can play the independent fundamentalist Baptist part. And at the end of the day, they just, they're there for no good. And I think we're pretty good at recognizing that a lot of the time. You know what we're not as good at recognizing is just people that are more dyed in the wool, average church lay people, um, that really go in there and just have bad behavior. And, and here's what I mean by that. If I cheerlead for Word of Truth Baptist Church, in other words, if I'm on social media and talking about the fact that this is, you know, just the greatest church to be at, which it is, and I just constantly have a message of how much I love this church, like it or not, people are going to associate my behavior with this church. And so the problem with that is if I behave myself badly, whether it's right or wrong, they're going to associate that with this church. Listen, you can go to church three times a week, you can be a soul winner, you can read your Bible and be in prayer and do all that stuff, and you can still go on social media and be an obnoxious jerk. That's just a fact, and it does happen. Sometimes you don't need to open your mouth. Sometimes you don't need to be the one to correct other people. And, and people just need to remember that. The Bible is our ultimate authority. Go back to James chapter 3. That's kind of our, our root passage for this. James chapter 3. <clears throat> Look for a second at verse 8. Starting in verse 8, I'm going to read through verse 13. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh? Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him shew out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. So the Bible talks about the fact that we shouldn't be having cursings and blessings coming out of our mouth. It, it exalts being meek and having wisdom. And what I want to do is, is kind of take a look at, at giving and receiving correction as a Christian and then kind of comparing that to what we see at Facebook Baptist Church a lot of the time. Because what you'll find is we're instructed to behave a certain way in this book, which is authoritative, and then a lot of times you get to Facebook Baptist Church and there's this big gap between how the Bible told us to react to things and how people, especially in a group, tend to react to things. Turn to Acts chapter 18. Acts 18. While you're turning to Acts 18, I want to read to you from Titus 3. Titus 3, verses 10 and 11, it says, A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So the Bible is very clear. When we're looking at how we're supposed to deal and react to people, it says for the heretic, admonish them once or twice and then reject them. We're done with it. But here's what's happening at Facebook Baptist Church so often. You know the term, laughed him to scorn, or he was laughed to scorn? The context there is one of people basically mocking other people. All right. When you look up laugh to scorn in the Bible, you will find 11 references to it in the entire Bible. Now three of them, and two are a parallel passage, so there's really only two examples, but three of them have to do with a prophecy of God. And he's referring kind of in a big sense about the nation of Israel and how they're going to, you know, laugh to scorn these other wicked nations. But that's used as sort of a big prophecy. When you look at all the other examples of it, you will not find an example anywhere of righteous people laughing the wicked to scorn. In other words, standing around and making an exercise of mocking other people. All right. Now, you will find one reference of the innocent mocking the wicked, but that comes out of I think it's Eliphaz in the book of Job, and that guy's all over the place. If you read carefully through the book of Job, you realize that Job is actually saying the right things. His friends are kind of all over the place. And in fact, Job in that very book, 
Um, he states the fact that the innocent actually are laughed to scorn by the wicked. And you'll find that repeated. Jesus Christ was laughed to scorn when he went to raise that girl from the dead and said, oh no, she's just sleeping. They laughed him to scorn. You'll find that prophetically written also in the book of Psalms. So my point is, laugh to scorn, the idea of mocking other individuals, you will not find Old Testament, New Testament, where God says, hey, as believers, find these heretics and then make a constant exercise of running over them with the bus. Make a constant exercise of making a joke out of them and crank calls and funny memes and all these different things that are going on. Look, we're supposed to admonish them twice and then reject them. Here's your equivalent for rejecting them. Unfriend them or block them. But don't bring them constant attention where you basically just keep dragging them back into the spotlight, giving them more attention because you just want to make a mockery of it constantly. And here's the hard thing for me. Sometimes I'm agreeing with the people that are doing the mocking. I understand the doctrine is messed up. And honestly, a lot of that stuff, when I first see it, it does make me chuckle. It does make me laugh. But that's not the question. The question is, how are we supposed to deal with the heretic? And here's the thing. When we're confusing influence with authority, do you understand somebody is observing the way you're dealing with people on Facebook? And they're going to come away with that with one of two options. They're either going to see it, and they're going to say, you know what, that's not right. And you're going to drive them away from the actual local New Testament church. Or they're going to see it and they're going to think, oh, I guess that's how we deal with people that don't get it. Either way, you're going in way the wrong direction. And I see that all the time. This whole laughing to scorn thing, I don't care if they're a heretic or not. Admonish them twice, be done with them. You're in Acts 18, correct? Yes. Look at verse 24. Give me just a second. I, I need to flip there myself. And Acts 18, verse 24. I'm going to read to the end of the chapter. Five verses. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, shewing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. And so we have this great picture here of somebody, he's got zeal, he's excited about the Lord, he knows a lot. But there were just some things he needed some tweaking on. There were some things that needed to be corrected. But he was saved. He's a brother. And you know what? They counseled him. They worked with him. They sent him back out. And he got stuff done. And, and it's this great picture of what we do with basically a brother or sister that just needs some doctrinal guidance. But here's the thing. I mean, I literally had a phone call from somebody who was telling me, how surprised they were that they went to a certain church, and this was a church in the association of churches that we often know of and think about, and he was so relieved that when he got there, the pastor was kind to him and welcomed them there, and the reason he expected he was going to get this brutal reception was to make a long story short, in Facebook Baptist Church, he kind of butted heads with somebody else, and that other person just sort of threw him under the bus on social media and pretty soon this guy's like a pariah all right so here's the thing he's taking the influence of social media and starting to attribute that to the reaction of the local New Testament church do you see how dangerous that is because now you're making an assumption that the mob on Facebook actually represents the same reaction you're gonna get from a God-ordained proper pastor in the church. And listen, this was, there was a doctrinal difference there. This guy did have a doctrinal issue. But you know what? Any pastor worth his salt 
is secure in his own doctrine. And we're not going to be threatened by somebody walking in that has a slightly different doctrine. You know where the issue is? The issue is when somebody wants to whisper and, and try to subvert the congregation. I mean, if you come in with a different type of doctrine, and I'm not talking about foundational stuff, like saved by grace through faith, of course. But if you come in with a different idea, maybe you're pre-trib, all right, whatever. You come in with that, as long as you're not trying to overturn everybody's thought process or whispering or murmuring about the pastor, most pastors are going to be fine with that. It's not even an issue. But you wouldn't know that sometimes from the reaction off Facebook Baptist Church. And so somebody who feels like they've just been run over in social media can go to a great, you know, soul-winning, New Testament local church, and not only does the pastor welcome him and say, you're welcome back anytime, but the men of God that are there welcomed him with open arms, and they had great fellowship. You know, and thankfully that man's at a Baptist church today, and he's thriving and doing okay, but how many people after they're thrown under the bus on social media maybe would never walk back into that Baptist church? Do you see how dangerous that is? And look, you've got to ask yourself a real simple question. If the pastor is saying, it's okay, you're free to be here, we're happy to have you and having fellowship with you, and all of Facebook Baptist Church is saying, you're out of here, bucko, and either calling him a heretic or whatever else and murmuring about him, who's right? I mean, because somebody's right and somebody's wrong. All right, and I'm just here to tell you, 99% of the time, Facebook Baptist Church is wrong. It's not right, and we, shouldn't, we really shouldn't allow it. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We've looked at the heretic. We've looked at the brother that needs doctrinal guidance. I'm going to read from Matthew while you're turning there. Matthew 18. I want to talk about the sinning brother. So here's somebody who's in sin. Matthew 18, verses 21 through 22. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Tell seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Our default emotion as Christians should be one of forgiveness. All right? We need to be compassionate towards other people. I know we get used to drawing this hard line with people, and we have to. There is so much wickedness and false teaching out there. It is, it is just a necessary fact of what we have to do. But especially when it comes to our brothers in Christ, we should be ready and willing to forgive. All right, everything in us should want to forgive. But I see this attitude at Facebook Baptist Church, and it's sort of this one of, you know what? If you're not right with me, or you're not right with my friends, you're not right with God. I mean, it really just is this attitude of cliques and clubs and groups, and it's totally unbiblical. You say, well, I don't really believe that. Well, I'll tell you, I know for sure that's what it is. You know, you have entire groups on Facebook that their one commonality is they all got kicked out of another group. I mean, this is fourth grader type of stuff. And now they're grouping around, and you've got hundreds of them. So the question becomes, are all 200 of them heretics? Is that really what happened? And in my own mind, I used to think to myself, well, yeah, but you know what? It's this guy and that guy. And they kind of go off half-cocked and post these things that are kind of weird and da-da-da. But then I got kicked out of the group. I was like, wait a minute. I didn't post a blasphemy. I didn't, you know. And all of a sudden, you get on the other side of it, and you realize, what's going on here? Why is the heretic getting two admonitions, and these people won't even talk to me? Does that make any sense? I mean, we've literally tried to ask people, hey, do you mind just telling us why you kicked us out of the group? Here's our answer. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Don't tell me that's biblical. And look, who cares? It's a Facebook group. Most people just blow it off. But here's the thing. That's most people. You know what? There's always going to be a few that take it to heart and take it to heart so deeply that they blow off the entire IFB movement. And that's, that's sad. They shouldn't take it that hard, but they will take it that hard. Turn to Acts chapter 7. I want to show you something. People get this really wacky idea about forgiveness. Acts chapter 7, this is, you know, Stephen's big exit. And, you know, Stephen was like the most amazing martyr of God ever. If ever there's a story in the Bible that kind of makes the arm, the hair stand up on my arms, it's Stephen because, 
I just think, man, this guy left a winner. I mean, talk about a guy who just nailed it. I mean, he just, he, he's talking to the Pharisees. He's just letting them have it. And it's just, it's perfect. I, I love the way that Stephen handled himself in this. It's, to me, one of the most inspiring stories in the Bible. Acts chapter 7, look at verse 56. And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So we want to look at influence versus authority in this big gap between what strong men of the Bible do and what happens on Facebook Baptist Church. So just picture this for a second. Stephen is being killed and he says, Lord, lay this not to their charge. Facebook Baptist Church, oh, I don't like a, a sermon you posted. I'm not your friend anymore. Oh, I don't like this meme you posted. I'm unfriending you. Oh, you made my friend mad, so you're out of the group. I mean, how ridiculous is this? You have to kind of look at it and just realize the level of immaturity is off the charts. Why can a spirit-filled man of God literally ask God to not lay the sin against, you know, to their charge while he's being killed and then we want to get offended by everything on Facebook. And it's this clicky, little groupy, you know, and listen, you can just take this to the bank. The people that are on Facebook that are always the quickest to kind of pull out the shotgun and say, you need to humble yourself or you owe me an apology, they're always the last ones to be able to forgive anybody else. You know, there's a lot of people that want to use this book and try to figure out how to justify having a root of bitterness in their heart towards other individuals. And yet, that's totally contrary to the Christian life. And so, we get into this whole group mentality, and, and this group and that group, and again, the big picture of it is it's just contrary to the character of Christianity. And so we need to be aware of that and not participate in it. Are you at 2 Timothy chapter 2? Let me read for you. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. And so what you see here is this picture of being patient, meekness, kindness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You know, you see the same thing with the brother that needs doctrinal guidance. You see the same thing with the sinning brother. It, it is an attitude of forgiveness and patience and meekness and love. The last church that we were in, we were there for about three months. And let me tell you this. We had a hard time finding a church. We just wanted to hear hard preaching. And of course, it needed to be King James Version. And of course, they needed to do some soul winning. And we needed to have those certain foundational things in place. Well, we found this church, and they were heavily dispensational. They were um, pre-trib. They were Zionistic. And so really, once you kind of got past the salvation by grace through faith, and they certainly weren't repent of your sins or anything like that, but once you got past the basic gospel, things started deviating pretty quickly. And so we had a pretty big doctrinal difference with them. But here's the thing. The pastor preached some of the hardest sermons we'd ever heard. I mean, there were times we got out of there and I thought, that was fantastic. I saw one of, I heard one of the best sermons on 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. That's the one about he that committed sin is of the devil. Anyhow, he did an excellent explanation of it. So I heard some amazing hard preaching out of that church. But here's the thing. 50% of the time we'd get out of there and it was like, oh, they'd get into end times prophecy or they'd get into Israel and they'd get into all these things. And it's like, 
you know, we'd spend the car ride home kind of talking about, you know, we don't agree with that. But here's what's amazing about it. We went out with them and we got a lot of soul winning done. And you know what? We were blessed by them and they were blessed by us. And we were able to co-labor together despite all those doctrinal differences. And I'm telling you, to this day, I would to God there was a thousand people in that church. Because despite the fact that doctrinally I don't agree with them, they've got the gospel right. They're going out and doing the work. People are getting saved. And when it all really boils down, I mean, what would you prefer? Are they, you know, saved and in a church that you don't agree with all of the doctrine? Would you just prefer nobody does anything? Because I'll tell you what, soul winning churches are hard to find. So if they're getting the work done, let them get the work done. And I guarantee you, that pastor in that church, they love us. They would to God that there was a thousand people in this church. And they know what this church stands for, believe me. We talked about it and they don't agree with us either. But you find this spirit of we're able to co-labor together in the Lord and then you get to Facebook Baptist Church and you see doctrinal differences that are a tenth that big, that aren't even close to that big, and all of a sudden it's World War III. Like everybody's fighting and bickering and getting about it. If what I'm saying to you is just quizzical and you don't understand what I'm talking about, God bless you. It probably just means you haven't gotten into a bunch of garbage on Facebook. That's a good thing. You know what? God bless the people that stick their Facebook usage to goats in pajamas. You know, and all those fun little cute things, do it. That's fine. I'm talking about, believe me, the people that know what I'm talking about know what I'm talking about. So this really does have to do with sort of the, the subculture that can become Baptists on Facebook. So, Facebook Baptist Church does not redeem the time. Facebook Baptist Church confuses influence with authority. And finally, Facebook Baptist Church undermines the local church. And this is the most dangerous part. Turn to Galatians 5. Facebook Baptist Church undermines the local church. I want to read to you from Philippians 2 before we get to Galatians. Philippians 2 says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. We're to do all things without murmurings and disputings. Can you honestly look at Facebook and say, generally speaking, the stuff that you see and do there is without murmurings and disputings? You know, because I would honestly hazard that sometimes that's almost how I do define Facebook. It is murmurings. It is disputings. I mean, that almost becomes the bottom line of it. So right off the bat, you know we're out of line there. Galatians chapter 5, look at verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. So there's a warning here, and, and obviously there's sort of a context of the fact that you actually have Christians biting and devouring one another. Listen, and here's the real danger. It's gossip. It's slander. It's backbiting. And it should never be named once among us. And we, don't, we aren't going to tolerate it here. It should never be a part of any church, especially here. And I want you to think about this. They just had the Red Hot Preaching Conference, right? And there were protesters. We were there at Verity a little over a month ago, and everything had just broken out with Orlando, and there were all these protesters there. Listen, <clears throat> what the world doesn't seem to understand is you could have a thousand protesters, you could have a thousand reprobates out the door, and all it does is it encourages us. All it does is it makes us dig our heels in a little bit deeper. We get that much more resolve. We get that much more determined to do the work and get it done. It doesn't do anything to break us down. Now there's a point where if they get the government involved enough, sure, they can start shutting some things down. But at the end of the day, those protesters, they're really not a danger. They're not a danger at all. But you know what? You put one big gossiper in a church and you will crumble that church from the inside out. That's a fact. And that's where we need to be really careful with social media. I'm just going to read some verses for you. You don't need to turn all of these, but I'm just going to kind of fast fire some verses for you just so you get kind of a, a taste and a context for how dangerous the gossiper is. 
Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Proverbs 16.28, A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separateth chief friends. Definition of whisperer, private messaging on Facebook. Titus 3.2, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, shewing all meekness unto men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. You know, we're not to speak evil of any man <clears throat> based just on the fact of being humble and realizing we have problems ourselves. That gets missed entirely in social media so often. James 4.11, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Here's a good one, Proverbs 26.20, Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no talebearer, the strife ceaseth. James 1.26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. I mean, take that to heart. Here's what God's saying. You can seem to be religious. You can do all the work for the Lord. And if you don't bridle your tongue, God says your religion is vain. That's pretty, that's pretty serious. Psalm 101.5, Whoso privily... Slandereth his neighbor. Here's private messaging again. Him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart will not I suffer. Leviticus 19.16. Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. I have multiple verses about the fool versus the wise person. Listen to this. Proverbs 10.19. In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin. But he that refraineth his lips is wise. Proverbs 18, 6 and 7. A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. Proverbs 21. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. I mean, I got pages and pages of this. And it comes down to this. God's saying, look, if you're wise, you'll learn how to shut your mouth. And if you're not wise, you're just going to blabber on and on and on and on. Facebook tendeth itself towards murmurings and disputings, all right, period. The Bible tendeth itself towards teaching us to be quiet and wise. It is contrary. Don't kid yourself. Here's some ways to prevent gossiping, all right, because we're not going to allow it at Word of Truth Baptist Church. Check your pride. All right. When you get pride out of the way, gossip will cease very quickly. Proverbs 13.10 says, Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. When the Bible says, Only by pride cometh contention, that means only by pride. And so what that means is if you're humble, if you humble yourself and live a humble life and recognize that you are just a lowly man before God, contention is going to cease. So humility is key. Here's a second way to prevent gossiping. Love God's word. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. When you love the word of God, what you do is you also understand his holiness and his, his love and his nature towards us. And you know what? You can take peace in knowing that God will make all things right. And when you rest in knowing that you have a creator and a God that sees all things and is able to rightly take care of all things, all of a sudden you realize you don't have to be offended by half the stuff you're even offended by. I don't think sometimes we realize that. You can make a choice to just say, I'm not, I don't have to deal with it. Let God deal with it. Look, if you have a brother or sister in Christ that's saying something or doing something that they ought not do, if they're truly a child of God, God's going to deal with them. All right? It's inevitable. Eventually, he's going to deal with them. Here's a way to fight back against gossiping. And Pastor Burzens has been very good about it. I've heard this out of him many times. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 23, it says, The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. You know, I don't even have to worry in this church about anybody slandering me behind my back because I just know from the character of the men that I'm with, you know, if they went to Sebastian or went to Pastor or to any of the men, we just wouldn't stand for it. You know, if somebody wants to come to me and talk to me about my brother in Christ here in this church, 
you were going to cut him off at the pass. We're going to meet that with an anger count and say, you need to go talk to him about that. And we just understand from God's word, that's the way we're going to conduct that. You know, and again, I mean it. A gossiper will do way more damage to this church than any protester, any, any reprobate. It doesn't matter. So we're going we're gonna to have our guard up. We're going to be vigilant about that. And we're just not going to allow it to creep in. And listen, it goes in a couple different directions. People in the church can go to Facebook and turn that into their little gossip thing. And then I've also seen cases where people gossip on Facebook and they try to draw the church in. You know, if people are having their own little spat and then they want to tag pastors and tag this person and tag that person and start getting people that are actually in the churches involved in whatever little problem they're having, that's wicked as hell. All right? Don't bring... Word of Truth Baptist Church or Verity Baptist Church or Faithful Word Baptist Church or Steadfast Baptist Church into your Facebook Baptist Church issue. You have no right to do that. You have no authority to do that. And what you're doing is wicked. You know what? Jesus Christ loved and died for the church. He did not love and die for the internet. And we need to remember that. It's not a church. Finally, don't let Facebook Baptist Church become a band-aid for a poor church environment. So Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, you know this verse, these verses as well. It says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Obviously, we need to be in church. If you are on Facebook Baptist Church and you don't even go to church, listen, you're not right with God, period. There's no way around that. But here's what I think happens more often. I think there's a lot of people out there where they're not super satisfied necessarily with their church and they kind of use Facebook as sort of their surrogate, fellowship, sort of Christianity type of a thing. So they go to a church, they're not super excited. Maybe it's lukewarm. Maybe their doctrine's kind of weird, whatever the case may be. But they're not really going to move anywhere. And so they're going to sort of try to fill in the gap, so to speak, with social media. Well, here's the thing. If you associate more with Facebook Baptist Church than you actually identify with your actual local church that you're going to, you need to start asking yourself some hard questions. Because maybe you need to just correct your attitude. Maybe it just comes down to you need to go all in with that church and everything would start smoothing itself out. Maybe you need to just look around in your local area and find a church you can be more in agreement with. You know, but it comes down to this, if you just have this dissatisfied attitude towards the local church, and then you're hanging out you know, on social media trying to get whatever bits of wisdom or biblical encouragement you can through that, <laughs> it's not going to work. It never works. And in fact, what you're doing is you're, you really are misplacing your whole priorities. You know, when we came out here to Prescott Valley, there were things that we had to sacrifice, but the funny thing is for all the stuff we've had to deal with, it's like Sean and I, we would never look back on coming here. I mean, if anything, we look at it, it's like, man, we should have done this sooner. What I don't think people understand all the time is how much you lose by being unsatisfied with your local church. And so there's plenty of good churches out there. And if you want to be, you know, in the greatest church in America, you know, you can do that. But if you don't want to live in Prescott Valley, there's Sacramento, there's Tempe, there's Texas, there's New Zealand. Go wherever you want, but figure it out. You want to convince yourself sometimes that the reason you can't move and go to a church is because it's financial or there's something logistical. Listen, it's a spiritual issue. It's always a spiritual issue because if you put the priority there, God will make a way for you to do that. How would he not bless it? It's almost impossible that he wouldn't bless it. And so when I talk about Facebook Baptist Church undermining the local church, I'm talking about, yes, gossip. That's a big thing. But the other thing is, the churches we associate with, they should all be way bigger. And the way that Facebook sort of undermines that is it may not be the total of it, but it's sort of a piece of what people do to kind of keep themselves in that place where they convince themselves, eh, I'm kind of all right here. You're not all right there. If, if you know it isn't right, you know the best thing you could do is shut off social media altogether. If you think, well, I'd be miserable if I didn't have this fellowship with them, you know what, good. Be dissatisfied for a little while. Let that motivate you to start putting a plan into place where you get to a church that you can be excited about and serve in. And you know what? I will say this. I praise God for the people I see on Facebook that are 
trying to make the move and putting things into motion and making the effort, that's a huge blessing. We need to see more of that. We need to see more people who are saying, I'm all in, you know, and if I can't be all in at this church, you know, hell or high water, I'm going to get to the church that I can do it at. Don't let Facebook be your band-aid. You know, and if you want to let it be your band-aid, then don't be surprised when your kids come home from vacation Bible school and they want to tell you how the Ewoks represent Israel and how Darth Vader's the prodigal son and they have all these wacky, convoluted ideas from vacation Bible school or Bible camp or whatever else. Look, it's going to cost you far more than you realize. So get into a church that you can be excited about and just remember, this is sort of the conclusion of the matter. Think about yourself. Focus on yourself. The purpose of this sermon is not for you to try to think of other people that are messing up on social media. Worry about yourself. Be deliberate in the time you spend on social media. Be wise about the things you say to people. Remember that people are observing you and making judgment calls on the local New Testament church based on the things you're saying. All right? We need to be deliberate. God is going to judge us by every idle word. So beware of Facebook Baptist Church. Let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Word of Truth Baptist Church. I thank you, Lord, that we have a local assembly where we can come together and have true fellowship. And I just pray, Lord, that you would protect this church from gossip and from slander. And that um, for any of us here, Lord, that are on social media, that we would just be careful in how we deal with others and how we conduct ourselves, Lord. And I just pray that you would bless this church and that we would grow mightily. And uh, we love you, Lord, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.